here. There is a great honor to be able to present this work. So, what I will be talking today is a brief introduction to a technique that we have in our lab and that we use extensively, namely scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And then I will take one physics example from the kind of work that we are doing to highlight the kind of things that you could do with this technique, but there are many others. So, before I forget, these are the students and postdocs who have mostly done the work that I will present in the second part. Okay. So, we all know the game of squash. You have two players, you hit the ball on the wall, the ball comes back and the other player hits it. If you were in the quantum world working with very, very tiny particles, let us say electrons, then you need these two players, but you also need one more player here. Because every once in a while, if this wall is thick en thin enough, you have a probability that this ball will find its way on the other side of the wall. This is what we know as quantum mechanical tunneling. And uh, this tunneling process which actually works for subatomic particles. You have uh, let us say an electron here, it can overcome this barrier and go on the other side not losing any energy. This uh, process is exponentially dependent or rather is exponentially reduced. The probability of finding the particle on the other side is exponentially decaying with the thickness of this barrier. And it also depends on the number of available particles on, on this side and the number of available empty states at the same energy on the other side. This is what is all encoded in this formula which is the tunneling matrix which is essentially the tunneling probability of an electron tunneling from this side to the barrier from this side to the other. Now, this process of tunneling can be translated to build a microscope and this is how it is done. You have a sample here which has uh, let us say a conducting surface and you take a normal metal tip and you bring it very, very close. By very, very close I mean you be bring it within let us say 10 angstrom from this surface and then you will have significant probability that an electron from this surface will tunnel to this tip or vice versa. Now, you move this tip, if this surface has a roughness, you will have a current that will vary because it is exponentially dependent on this distance between this tip and this surface and therefore, you can get the topography of the surface. Now, in practice of course, this is not what you do because if you do that, you might crash the tip on one of the hillocks. Instead, you try to maintain the current constant through a feedback and you take the tip up and down and you track how much you are going up and down. So, if you do that, you can get a surface like this. For example, this is a 50 nanometer by 50 nanometer surface of something called niobium nitride where you see atomic scale terraces. But this is not the most spectacular thing. If you have a really smooth surface like here you have niobium diselenide, then you can see individual atoms because you have a higher electron density around the atoms. So, you see here individual atoms of selenium and you also see a charge density wave reconstruction which I will not go into any detail and that is why some of the selenium atoms are darker than the others. All right. Now, microscope is fine, but there are many other microscopes like transmission electron microscope and so on. One thing that one additional thing that you can do with an STM is also spectroscopy, energy resolved information on these electrons. For example, if I take this uh, molecule pentacene, I put it on a substrate and then I uh, do come with a STM tip on the top of this uh, molecule and I do a current voltage characteristics or DIDV versus voltage characteristic. You see that within this range, the current is 0 and then here it picks up. This is what is the known as the homolumo gap in the, the gap between the energy gap between the highest occupied uh, molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Similarly, for example, this is a gallium arsenide epilayer 
and you can find you can see here the tunneling current is zero here it picks up and this is this gives you the gap the uh, semiconducting gap of gallium arsenide all right the principle of tunneling spectroscopy is that you have two metals on two side one of them is the tip and of course if you don't apply any bias voltage you can have tunneling either way so there is no current uh, however if you apply a voltage you will have more tunneling from one side to the other and uh, the uh, opposite will happen if you apply a negative voltage and therefore now you will have tunneling current that will flow but this tunneling current will also depend on the density of states of electrons here and what you can show with some very simple mathematics that the derivative of the current versus voltage is proportional to the density of states of the material that you are probing. Now, where this technique is really useful and is much more powerful than most other spectroscopic techniques is when you have very small energy scales of the order of millivolt. One of them happens to be the superconducting energy gap which is few milli electron volt. And the superconducting in a superconductor you have the density of states which is zero within the gap and then it has a divergence close to the gap edge and then at high energy it becomes same as the normal state, the non superconducting state. So, you come on a superconductor with a tip and you do a DIDV characteristic in the superconducting state you see a conductance versus voltage that looks like this that mimics this density of states slightly broadened through due to finite temperature. If you go above the superconducting transition you get something which is flat and that is the, this blue line in the super in a normal metal. Alright, now such this is the microscope that we have built in TIFR, this is a home built system, everything other than the control electronics is built in house. It goes the it is inside a fridge, so it goes down to about 350 not 300, but practically 350 milli Kelvin. You, you can apply a magnetic field of 9 Tesla and one of the most important thing of doing scanning tunneling microscopy is that you need a very clean non contaminated surface and therefore, you prepare this sample either in situ here and without exposing to air with these manipulators you push it down inside your STM head or you could sorry or you could use this kind of a toy which is actually a vacuum suitcase. It is a it is something where you can prepare your sample in a reference chamber and store it here at a vacuum of 10 to the power minus 10 tor, carry this suitcase wherever you like, attach it to your STM and now put it in. Again the sample does not see here. With this introduction let me now show in next uh, 9 minutes or so a little bit of what we can do. So, we know that in a superconductor if you take a type 2 superconductor which is the vast which is what the vast majority of superconductors are, then above a certain uh, field you have magnetic field that penetrates like this cartoon here, it penetrates in the form of flux tubes and each of these flux tubes have exactly one flux quantum of flux. If you look from the top it will look like this wherever you have this flux entering the superconductivity is locally destroyed. So, it will look like a normal metal surrounded by regions where there is no flux tube. So, that is a superconductor. Now, these uh, are like tiny bar magnets and therefore, they repel each other. Because they repel each other this interaction stabilizes these vortices into a lattice like this a hexagonal lattice which is called the vortex lattice. The way you can image this vortex lattice is the following. Let us take these three points on the surface of a superconductor where I have applied a small magnetic field. And now, I do this spectroscopy starting from point B to point A. I pass through this vortex here at C. You can see at B, I have this very nice superconducting gap. As I approach B, uh, sorry, as I approach C, which is at the center of the vortex, it is a normal metal, I do not have a gap anymore that is here. And then when I go back to A, 
I again have this gap. So I can actually find out the location of the vortex by doing this kind of uh, spectroscopy. Now you see here I told you that this is a normal metal but actually you see a peak here instead of this dip. This peak is because here the normal electrons are confined in two dimensions at least uh, inside the vortex and therefore this confinement is like particle in a box. So very crudely speaking this is like a wave function of the particle in a box it is because of this confinement you have a peak at the center. All right. Now what you can do is you do not take so much of data but you just stay at this bias voltage close to the coherence peak and you scan over the surface. When you do that then you will get this kind of an image that I showed you before. However, this kind of a vortex lattice which is well ordered hexagonal you realize only at low temperature and moderately low fields. This is like a virtual solid and therefore like any solid if you increase temperature or field you can melt this solid it can go into a disordered state. And this is typically the phase diagram as a function of magnetic field and temperature you have this ordered state here if you increase temperature at a fixed field you go into a disordered state if you increase magnetic field you also go in a disordered state. This is not this is something that is known for quite some time and there was a group in TIFR which has studied this for many years and the signature of the melting or this disordering you can see from susceptibility for example the susceptibility increases and then at a characteristic magnetic field it suddenly crashes this is a susceptibility measured at 350 milli kelvin. This crashing of the susceptibility is what is associated with the order disorder transition. What we will do now is to track what happens microscopically to the vortex lattice as you go across this order disorder transition. So I start from this field I have a well ordered vortex lattice this is the Fourier transform with 6 sharp sorts. I increase a little bit here and then now I start seeing defects in this lattice. These defects are in the form of adjacent site with 5 fold and 7 fold coordination which is called dislocations. I increase further I have more dislocations and then I cross this peak this dip here this minima ok now I am right at the minima I have even more dislocation but I still have this diffuse 6 spots and then I cross this field what I start seeing is a different kind of defects these are isolated 5 fold or 7 fold defects without a nearest neighbor counterpart. This is what is called disclination and as soon as I have disclination I have no orientational order anymore. So the Fourier transform becomes a circle. I can increase further I have more disclination and eventually very close to the critical field I can see that the vortex the now individual vortices are not well resolved because they have started moving and this is the melting of the vortex lattice this is the onset of the melting. Okay, now we this observation made us believe that we have actually here two phase transitions happening one which is when I have dislocations that is destroying the positional order but still in the Fourier transform I can see that the orientational order is intent and the second one is when I start getting disclination where the orientational order is also lost. This is very different from a conventional solid which just melts to a fast order phase transition from a order to a disordered state. So this I will not go into the detail but this intermediate state has unusual correlation functions and uh, this is what we call as orientational loss. This is not a ordered solid not a completely disordered solid but somewhere in between which has orientational order but no long range positional order. Alright, so now the phase diagram becomes like this what I have shown you before had just this one line now I get these two lines in the phase diagram I have a ordered state here I have a orientational glass here and then I have a vortex glass which is equivalent to an amorphous solid which has no positional or orientational order. The question that I can ask is are these really phase transitions? 
So, we tried to we know that normal solids disorder through first order phase transition and we wanted to ask ourselves whether these could be two phase transitions, this could be two phase transitions, this how much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. All right. So, one of the thing that is a hallmark of a first order phase transition is what we know as, okay, this is not working, is what we know as superheating and supercooling. For example, you can take water and you know that below 0 degree water freezes, but if you take very pure water and you do not shake it and put it in your deep freeze, you can cool water down to a very low temperature, practically you can easily do this experiment with in your fridge down to minus 12 Kelvin, 12 uh, degree centigrade and uh, you will see that water will remain water till you heat it. You heat it and momentarily the whole uh, water will freeze into a solid. So, this is what is known as super cooling. And similarly, you can heat a solid above its melting point, which is called superheating. Now, we wanted to see if what we does this across these lines, we have superheating and supercooling. So, you start from here, you have an ordered state, you cross and go here, you still have an ordered state, but it should have been disordered according to our phase diagram. But now you shake the vortex lattice a little bit immediately you see all these dislocations appearing. You cool from here to this point, you still have this dislocation, you shake it and immediately all the dislocations disappear. The same sequence happens here, you have here now you are already in the orientational last state, so you have dislocations, you hit it here, you can still see the uh, six fold symmetry remaining, but as soon as you shake it, sorry, as soon as you, as soon as you shake it, it becomes a circle. So, there is no orientational order left. And uh, similarly, you can also do the super cooling experiment here. So, what is the reason for this strange behavior and I am at the end now. We know that regular crystalline solid, they uh, disorder through this first order melting. But here, we this vortex lattice is formed in a solid, which is a superconductor. And the solid has crystalline defects, which act as spinning centers for these vortices. And therefore, this solid actually is sitting in this kind of a random pinning potential. And we believe that it is the presence of this random pinning potential, which is giving rise to this two step transition from a ordered to a disordered state. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you.